This is Glenn Fulcher with another issue of Language Testing Bites. Welcome to issue 29 of Language Testing Bites. In volume 361 of Language Testing, we published a research study on the effect of read aloud assistance of texts for dyslexic learners. This is a topic that is addressed only very infrequently in the language testing literature. And even in the general educational assessment field, it doesn't get the attention that it truly deserves. That's not only because there's an ethical imperative to ensure that all test takers are treated equally with regard to opportunity and access, but also because the legal frameworks of many countries now require educational providers to ensure that no one is disadvantaged because of a learning difficulty. And in this podcast, we talk to Judith Cormos of Lancaster University, one of the co-authors of the study, to explore the field of test accommodations. Judith, thank you for agreeing to talk to us on this issue of Language Testing Bites about this really important topic in fair test design and administration. Thank you for inviting me to talk about our research on the impact of read aloud assistance on text comprehension that we conducted together with colleagues from the University of Ljubljana and with my colleague Michael Rataitsak at the University of Lancaster. First of all, for listeners who aren't familiar with the concept of test accommodations, could you briefly outline for us what we mean by test accommodations or special arrangements and who they're provided for? Test accommodations, or in other words, special arrangements, are meant to help candidates to demonstrate the best of their knowledge in tests. Special arrangements can include a number of different things, um, for example, extended time, the use of scribe or um, a dictation tool, test papers printed in larger letters, or being tested in a separate room, quiet, which is quiet and free of distractions, just to name a few of these. Um, Who are entitled for special arrangements or uh, test accommodations? Well, these are for students who have some type of disability or who temporarily might be hindered in one way or another to perform a test to the best of their abilities. So um, we are talking about here um, candidates um, who might have, for example, visual or hearing impairments, specific um, physical or medical or perhaps sometimes mental conditions. And these conditions can be just short term, for example, somebody just broke their arm, or um, in some cases, unfortunately, they can be longer term conditions. And among those who are entitled for special arrangements, it's important to mention students with specific uh, learning difficulties as well. Now that's quite a range of different conditions that require accommodations and changes to test delivery to try and compensate for the disadvantages that these test takers face. There's clearly a validity issue here, both with regard to mitigation of disadvantage and whether the accommodation would benefit non-disadvantaged test takers. Can you talk us through the validity issues at stake? Um, I'd be particularly interested to hear your views on the claim that goes well back to the work of Phillips, I guess, that introducing listening, for example, to a reading test essentially changes the test construct and makes this a modification rather than an accommodation. Indeed, there are clear and important validity issues when applying special arrangements in a language testing context. First of all, it's important to understand that there are two major types of special arrangements and the way they are distinguished uh, is also tied to validity. Accommodations don't affect the validity of assessment and this is why it's actually better to use a broader cover term, special arrangements, uh, so as we don't confuse them with accommodations, which are one type of special arrangement. So what is an accommodation, for example? Let's take um, printing a test um, in, uh, on paper in bigger size uh, letter. Well, this clearly won't affect um, the contract of reading if that's what we want to assess. Um, modifications, on the other hand, as their name suggests, the um, impact and validity, they modify the construct that we want to measure. 
And often there is a real issue here because it does happen sometimes that the student's disability doesn't allow us to assess a construct fully. For example, if we print a transcript for a listening test for a hearing impaired candidate, we are not assessing the speech decoding component of listening comprehension anymore. So that's a modification. And similarly, when we have a student who has a reading disability, we face another problem. How can we assist the student to overcome this disadvantage in a reading test so that the reading construct is not effective, affected? Um, we could allow the student to listen and read um, the text at the same time, but then we are giving support with written text decoding. Our intonation might give away what, where to pay attention, for example, um, might highlight information units as well. So we are not fully assessing the reading construct. So getting back to your question about Philips 1994, um, yes, I agree that introducing listening to a reading test is a modification because it affects the construct validity of the test. Thanks for that. Now, can we turn to your research? You're particularly concerned with the problems faced by learners with dyslexia when taking high stakes English language tests. Now to start off, can you first define dyslexia for us and explain what kinds of issues learners with dyslexia face when taking these tests? Dyslexia is a type of specific learning difficulty and in its narrow sense, in the psychological literature, it is defined as a word-level reading difficulty and it is distinguished from higher-level text comprehension problems, which in the psychological literature are called specific reading comprehension impairment. However, different types of specific learning difficulties often overlap and it is important to note that they don't just manifest in reading problems. What are the causes of reading-related um, specific learning difficulties? Um, most importantly, uh, problems with phonological awareness, distinguishing and manipulating sounds. Um, students uh, with um, reading-related SBLDs, specific learning difficulties, tend to have shorter working memory capacity and slower information processing speed. They might also face challenges in regulation, regulating their attention. Obviously, these um, cognitive differences can have um, a wide range of impact on different areas of second language learning and performance. So one of the logical um, impacts or effects of uh, reading-related SPLDs on test performance is that students tend to be slower and less accurate readers. They might also find it difficult to remember and recall the information that they have read or heard. Um, they may not hear or notice differences between similar sounding words in listening, and they might have spelling difficulties when they write. Um, they often need more time not only to understand the text, but also to process the information they read or heard, and then reproduce it in, in a response. They might also be slower writers. And finally, their attention might wander away while they do a test. And let me just again highlight that we should remember that these difficulties um, might vary quite a bit um, individual by individual. Well, it's clear that the issues here are very important from a validity point of view, as we mentioned earlier. So let's now turn to your study, if we may. As I understand it, you had a fairly large number of participants taking a reading test under three different conditions. Can you talk us very briefly through your choices in methodology, including participants and instruments, but perhaps not dwelling too much on statistical analysis? So in our study, we were interested in finding out what happens when we ask students to read a text, listen to it, or read and listen to a text at the same time. So we had three conditions, read, listen, and uh, reading while listening. Um, and we wanted to find out how students' comprehension scores vary across these three conditions, and um, to see whether um, the difference in variation in scores depends on whether someone is dyslexic or not. 
Um, we had a relatively large um, sample size. We worked with 233 um, young Slovenian uh, students with no identified dyslexia and 47 students uh, who had an official um, dyslexia identification. And all the children were aged around uh, 12 and had been learning English uh, for about four years. Um, we worked with four tasks uh, from the battery of Slovenian national English tests uh, for year six students. Um, these tasks um, have been developed uh, in Slovenia for this target population. And um, the tasks we selected included short uh, informational texts and then uh, three, six uh, short answer comprehension questions. And these tasks um, have been used um, in previous assessment rounds for these children and had acceptable reliability indices. So out of the, the four texts that we worked with, um, two were slightly more difficult in the sense that the input texts had uh, higher flash Kincaid reading ease values, and two were somewhat less difficult as indicated by the flash reading ease uh, scores. In order to have a listening uh, recording that the students can um, uh, hear, uh, either alone in the listening only condition or in the read aloud condition, we asked the native speaker to read out all texts at an appropriate uh, reading speed. We designed the studies so that each group of students um, would read two texts, listen to one text, and um, listen and read one text simultaneously. Groups got different texts in different conditions and also varied in the order in which the, they completed the, uh, the tasks in the three modality. In this way, it was possible to compare the students' performance in the three uh, modalities across texts uh, as well. The reading tests were group administered and uh, took around 30-40 minutes, so one, um, one class hour time. And uh, we also relied on the relatively accurate um, and detailed dyslexia identification procedures in Slovenia and recorded whether the student had an official certification of their dyslexia. But we also administered some independent assessment of the four uh, key dyslexia ID identification tasks from a Slovenian assessment battery individually to the students. And most of the research was done by uh, two uh, very helpful trained research assistants who uh, were MA students at the University of Ljubljana, uh, Klavdija Lekan and Tadala Dejayan, and uh, our co-author Milena Koshak babu that also took an active role in the individual assessment phase of the project. Okay, and can you now summarize the findings for us? So first of all, our results showed that dyslexic participants performed significantly below the level of their non-dyslexic peers in every single mode, except for the read aloud assistance condition in the case of the difficult texts. And this is important uh, because it underscores um, that dyslexic students also experience challenges in listening comprehension, not just in reading. And this is particularly true when they can only listen to a text once, like in our study, and when they have to remember specific um, pieces of information, as was the task again in our research. Now, importantly, um, as the main focus of their study was the effect of the mode of uh, text presentation, our results showed that young non-dyslexic uh, second language learners performed quite similarly across the three modes, reading, listening, and reading while listening. Um, and read aloud assistance didn't enhance the reading comprehension for dyslexic participants when reading easy texts either. Um, but in the case of the difficult tests, um, difficult texts, um, dyslexic participants benefited from the read aloud assistance more than their non-dyslexic peers. And interestingly, we also found that the read aloud condition, so to speak, equalized um, performance when processing the more difficult, more challenging text, because there was no significant um, difference in comprehension between dyslexic and non-dyslexic students. So therefore, it can be concluded that listening to the text while reading gives a differential boost to the performance of young dyslexic uh, second language learners 
when the text is a little bit more challenging for them. So the main findings with regard to dyslexic learners appears to be that the accommodation was of little benefit when the texts were easy, but there was a boost to their scores when the texts were classed as difficult. Perhaps to conclude the podcast, perhaps can I ask about the application of this finding? I mean, if you were asked to advise an examination board on the provision of read aloud accommodations for registered dyslexic test takers, what advice would you give? Our results show that read aloud assistance, especially when texts are challenging, can be potentially um, a useful special arrangement in certain assessment contexts. As uh, our study reveals, read aloud assistance can offset some of the negative impacts of disability on achievement and on students' ability to demonstrate their second language knowledge. It is important, however, to, to remember that when we allow candidates to read and listen to a text at the same time, as we discussed at the beginning of the interview, we are not fully assessing written text decoding skills. Read aloud might um, support visual word recognition. Um, intonation can help uh, identifying information units and um, emphasis. Um, human readers' nonverbal clues uh, can perhaps help students to understand or infer implied meaning. So, if this special arrangement is used, um, in high-stakes assessment contexts, there needs to be a, a disclaimer um, in the certificate about the application of read aloud assistance and, and the relevant note um, to the score users that the read aloud assistance was used. Well, to some extent, I've been wondering about the broader question for the future, um, that with the advance of technology, um, perhaps uh, multimodal reading will become a typical or more common reading mode. And then we can actually consider or think about how important it will be uh, to assess the text comprehension in a single mode only. Um, well, um, until that time, perhaps one more question or issue to consider for test um, developers is um, to examine how a read aloud assistance could be used in providing test instructions and thereby assist all test takers, not, the ju not just those um, with disabilities, to understand clearly what they need to do um, in a test. I think the practical benefits of this kind of research to improving test fairness are very significant and I do hope that your excellent contribution in this paper will inspire others to work in this field. Thank you very much for sharing your research with us. It has been a pleasure to talk about our study and I hope other researchers will also follow us investigating this issue with different learners, different types of texts and tasks in other assessment contexts. Thank you for listening to this issue of Language Testing Bites. Language Testing Bites is a production of the journal Language Testing from Sage Publications. You can subscribe to Language Testing Bites through iTunes or you can download future issues from ltj.sagepub.com or from languagetesting.info. So until next time, we hope you have enjoyed the current issue of Language Testing Bites. Thank you.